Um, it has been my pleasure to work on this project. Today, we're going to go, I'm going to give you some background that's necessary to understand the, uh, the rest of the presentation. And then I'm going to go into the two different parts of the project. One part of the project focuses on the production aspect of cacao in this region of Colombia. And the other part of it focus, uh, focuses on marketing issues that they had and how we address those. So for the background, just give you a little idea of the production and consumption of cacao in the world. Um, most of cacao production, 75% of it comes from the Ivory Coast in Ghana. A little bit comes from Latin America, though that is where it originated. And you can see that the consumption is, is totally, totally different than that. Europe and the United States consume most of the world's cacao, chocolate products, um, confections, things like that. And most of this is it's done by large or small scale farmers. 90 to or 85 to 90 percent of the production is done by small smallholder farmers throughout the world, which is which makes it a very very interesting crop, right? Especially when you consider it in a development context, because it's not something that they produce to consume. It's something that they produce to put cash in their pocket, right? Um, though the production side is so fragmented. There's somewhat of an oligopoly on the buyer side of things. There's four or five large companies throughout the world that buy almost all of the cacao in the world, which makes for some interesting dynamics between those two players. Um, there has been an increase since about 2005 in these kind of niche markets. If you've heard of the bean to bar movement in the United States, or if you've heard of, I mean, there's several different um, certification schemes, organic, fair trade, and, and so on and so forth. Those have been able to help some of these smallholder farmers exit that that uh that relationship to some degree but it's still a very very large challenge that they face the area that we did the study in is called montes de maria it's an area in northern colombia um sparsely populated area there's uh, agriculture is the definitely the largest economic driver in this region historically avocados have been their main crop that's they they ate a lot of it good source of protein but they also sold a lot of it to to domestic markets and that was kind of their cash crop um, palm oil and cacao or other cash crops that they use, but they a large a lot of their production was was just for them to eat. A lot of yucca, yams, maize, a um, little bit of rice. Um, so Monte de Maria is a region that has been. I was told by the university there that this region is the region that was second most afflicted by the violence, the armed violence in Colombia. A large large rate of um, of homicide, of massacre, of displacement. What, for those of you that don't know, back in about the 1950s, Colombia started having, having issues with land rights and these different groups formed. Today, or I guess in the last 20 years, there's been three primary groups. You've got the paramilitary, you, you have the government forces, and you have the guerrilla forces. And in this region in particular, we heard story after story of people where, the, where one group would come in and say, give us food or we're going to kill you. And then another group would come in and say, give us food or we're going to kill you. Or they would say, hey, we heard you're going to, you supported this other group, so we're going to kill you. So, so you can imagine these farmers, they're, they're facing this, this issue. They're not, they're not sure who to support, who not to support. A lot of them just left. A lot of them left this region. As of about 2010, a lot of those groups left that area, and people started coming back. Some people, unfortunately, have said that they will, they will never come back. But people, the farmers, the smallholder farmers, have started to return to this region. So... The area is left in shambles. There's huge scars, economically speaking, socially speaking, um, and some groups have this, have tried to use cacao as a as a reason or as a a vehicle through which they can rebuild some of the economic prosperity in this area. One of the reasons they introduced cacao to the, re the area was because in, in the early 2000s, um, the region was hit by a by a strand of phytophthora, which is a fungal disease, fungal disease, and it wiped out a lot of the avocado crop, made it fairly un improper, unprofitable to grow uh, avocados in the region. So they're looking for another cash crop that could take the place of, of avocados. Um, so a bunch of government non-government non organizations introduced this crop today. There's about 1,200 growers. About half of those are organized into eight different um, cacao growers associations. And this gives you kind of an idea of the average size of the farms out there. This is small small scale agriculture. You got an average farm size of 18 hectares, they're only growing on about six hectares of that, and only about one and a half hectares of that is cacao. So it's a fairly, fairly typical, what I would consider a typical smallholder um, situation there. So you can understand the situation of cacao. They're, they're still very inexperienced in cacao production there. The yields are about 130, 435 kilos per hectare, which is easily one-tenth of what they're getting in other parts of the country. That's 
largely due to a lack of agronomic knowledge of how to grow the crop. Quality, 100% of it is sold to the lowest quality in, in Colombia. And about 90 to 95% of that is sold through a system of intermediaries to one buyer, which makes for terrible price negotiation. So this next part is, is the development of some econometric models. For like my thesis defense, I would go into a lot more technical detail. We're going we're gonna to skim over it here. We're not going to go into the technical details of this. I'd be happy to answer questions about the technical de details afterwards, just for the interest of time. Um, we're going to have to go through this pretty quick. But So basically, this is the idea. We have a two-step process. The first thing we want to do is identify which production practices amongst these farmers, meaning irrigation, fertilizer use, herbicide use, are having the largest effect on yields. Okay? So that's the first step. We've identified which production practices have the largest effect on yields. And then we want to understand which socioeconomic or demographic factors are affecting the adoption of those most important production practices. So again, two steps. What are the most important production practices? Second step, what are the socioeconomic and demographic factors that, that are affecting the adoption of these two? This is the re a lot of research has been done on on both of these um, separately. We we didn't find any research that really combined these two into into a process for development. Mm -hmm. This is something we hope to add to the literature: is is looking at what are the most important production practices, and then what are the socioeconomic factors that are affecting that in a specific region. And this that, that's how you can use this as a tool for development. So we use a simple OLS model for yield that took had a yield, yield as a dependent variable and as a as independent variables groups of farmer demographics farm metrics production practices and social capital something very typical that you would see in, in a in a um, production function and then we developed a set of six different technology adoption models one for each of the production practices we decided to decided to include this is a binary adoption metric so adoption of the practices was one yes zero no for for fertilizer use for herbicide use so on and so forth, and we also, we still good? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, there we go. Hopefully you guys can hear me. And then we developed a, an adoption index, just uh, one through six, how many of those six different production practices that, did they adopt? We wanted to combine these two models, so we used something called structural equation modeling. Basically, structural equation modeling um, restructures the covariance matrix, and it allows you to test for uh, mediation effects. The basic idea is this. Let's say that we say we look at association membership and we believe that it has a positive effect on yield, right? So that's a direct effect. We may also believe that association, the effect of association membership on yield is mediated through an increase in the use of fertilizers, right? So th that's the basic idea of mediation effects in structural equation modeling. We'll dive a little bit deeper as we go through the results. We collected this data using four awesome local enumerators. They, were, they worked so hard, and they, it, they, would, they did work we never would have been able to, right? We, they already knew the regions. They knew a lot of these farmers. We did 277 surveys um, during this last summer. They looked at production practices and socioeconomic and demographic factors. They used Qualtrics on a tablet. I highly recommend that system if any of you are collecting data in large quantities um, in, in settings like this. So the first is our uh, the first results we have are the yield results. We developed this yield model, right? Now we we grouped our, our variables into production practices and socioeconomic and demographic factors. We noticed that three of these production practices show statistically significant results. The other three, grafting, pruning, and pesticide use, they show statistically insignificant results. Agronomic knowledge tells us that that's I mean, it doesn't mean that it's not having an effect on yields in this region, but that these are not the, the practices that are having the largest effect. So real quick interpretation of these. Farmers who are applying fertilizers are yielding 37% more than farmers who are not in this particular region. Farmers who are, so this is a measure of harvest intensity, any number of months harvested per year. The average is 4.6. The recommendation is 10. Right, so a lot of people are leaving fruit on the trees. Literally, there's low-hanging fruit out there, right? So, for every additional month that a farmer harvested, they, on average, increase their yield, their annual yield, by 16%. And a very interesting thing we saw is that those farmers using herbicides were, were yielding 38% less than those who are not. A lot of explanations we could go into on that, a lot of possible reasons, maybe training implications that we could go into. Unfortunately, we don't have time for that right now. 
Then we look at socioeconomic and demographic factors, and there's a bunch of them. A lot of them are interesting. For example, males are harvesting 50% more than females in this particular region. We want to focus on what we would call policy variables, things that we as a leader of an association or as a member, as a leader of one of these NGOs, can really have an effect on. So we look at association membership and the number of buyers sold to. We see a negative effect of, with association membership, possibly due to some selection bias, possibly due to some things they're teaching there. Um, the, the, the reason is that government give incentives for for cooperatives and they target the poorest, the, the poorest farmers mm -hmm. or mo the, mo the most disadvantaged farmers. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, then we look at our technology adoption models. So we only look at the three, because there's six models, right? We're only gonna review the three that have the statistically significant effect on yields. First, we see that training really does actually increase the, some increased adoption of, of certain technologies, right? Also with harvest intensity, we see that there's a lot of statistically significant results. And these, these are what we would consider policy vari variables, measures of training, financial aid, the buyer structure in the market, and uh, membership and associations, right? So I would love to discuss each one of these, but unfortunately we don't have time. <laughs> these are the results of the structural equation model. In order for us to test for mediation effects, three, three relationships have to be statistically significant. This direct effect between the socioeconomic or demographic factor and the, uh, the yield, and also the relationship, the two relationships between the socioeconomic factor and the, ado the technology adoption and then the technology adoption and yield. Only two relationships in our model showed statistical significance on all, th all three of those, but they're very interesting results. First, we see that yes, there's a negative relationship between association membership and yield per hectare, but we see that there's when you mediate that effect through harvest intensity, there's a positive relationship, meaning that there's some other set of factors out there that are stronger than this positive effect through, through an increase in harvest intensity that is having a negative effect and then when considering these, this association membership. The other factor that we looked at is number of buyers. And we see as we test for mediation effects, we see that there's, yes, a positive direct effect between the number of buyers that a person is selling to and the yield per hectare. And we see that 29% of that is mediated through an increase in harvest intensity. So this is a place where we can, we can in this case, state causality. So. Okay, so we really breezed through that fast. Again, please come to me afterwards and talk to me about the, te the technical details if you want to know. Now we're going to focus a little bit more on the marketing side of things. And the SMART team, which I don't know if any of them are here. Some of them said they were going to come. But the SMART team is a, a team we put together to address this question. We saw that about 95% of the cacao that was leaving this region was being sold to one buyer. Which, they, like I said before, the, buyer, the sellers were very grateful for this buyer. For a long time, they, they supported them. They, they're like, we feel like we can be getting more, right? So the question we wanted to answer, can producers in Montes de Maria capture more of the value chain through secondary processing and marketing of cacao? Yeah. Some of them will not be familiar what SMART is. What yeah. Can you explain very I will on the, ne oh, the next will. slide. <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. So we want to answer this question, and more importantly, we want to understand it. If, that, if so, how can, how can they do that? Um, you need to understand a little bit about the structure of associations there. Like I said, there's 1,200 growers. About eight of them are members of some cacao growers association. There's one large association who's, um, who's got the largest number of buyers. They're the oldest, but they're also very sluggish. Several members of this association have been asking this question that we just asked for a very long time, but the association is, is slow to react. So a couple of other um, associations have formed out of this larger association, one of them being Asoprocos. We decided to work with Asoprocos because they were the most forward thinking and they were, the one, they were an association that had already actually started to develop some of these products on their own, right? So they had really fine-tuned the production practices and we wanted, they wanted to understand, they said, okay, we know how to produce this stuff. We've got plenty of supply. What's our market? Is there a market here? Can we do something with this? So we put together a smart team to try to understand this. I think you, you were on the smart project, weren't you? Yes. Any other smart team participants before? No? Any of you undergrad or graduate students, I highly recommend doing it. So the background on the smart project, it's it, team, uh, student teams, consulting teams that are put together to go and consult a small to medium enterprise in, in any 
given region of the world. This last year, we had nine projects that went to South America, Africa, and Southeast Asia. Ours was one of them. This was our team right here, a very, very awesome team, hardworking. I can't say enough good things about them. They did some incredible work while, while they were there. All of these um, projects are focused around food or agriculture in some degree. So what we did, before we left, we did a lot of pre-research. We spoke with uh, Antonio and Tulio Rodriguez, who are the leaders of Asafocos, to really understand what their need was and what they had already done and what they wanted to do in the future. Most of the work was done from January 7th to 17th of this year. We hit the ground and we did farm visits and we did customer surveys and we did graphic design. We did a bunch of different things to put together a marketing plan. And the marketing plan had five components. These five components we decided on after many, many discussions with Antonio and Tulia and a lot of different research. So we're going to talk about each one of these, um, these aspects very quickly because we're about out of time. <laughs> The first is we, we did some customer identification. We hit the streets, we looked for people that might be interested in cacao products. We see, received overwhelming support. Not or People weren't just like, oh, that's great. It's great to know that there's a, a local association that's, that's, doing, um, that's doing cacao products. They're like, do you have product with you right now? Can we buy it? Is there, I mean, we want to put this stuff in our stores, right? Which is very good to see, but we were also able to identify the product mix of different places and recommend Tasso Procos first five producer or first five buyers that they should focus on to try it because they were producing very small amounts as the was at this time and they needed to be able to scale their production so we said okay start with these five and then once you've got your production scalable then address the, the rest of this list see so one comment is that these markets or these buyers are in Cartagena which is a city about um, uh, two hours away from the place so we are not thinking about export market which is usually a thinking when you think about this these type of cash crops. Domestic markets are a huge opportunity. So that's I think that was that yeah. was very smart. Yeah. Did. Yeah, again, there's not there's not a huge export market, especially if you don't have quality. And none of the growers in Montes de Maria at this time have the quality necessary. Maybe in the future, yes. Mm -hmm. But we felt that this was a necessary stepping stone in between where they are now and export markets. So then we, we did some branding and presentation uh, we work for them. We came in the name of Chocolate Monte Mariana, which is, which is fine, but even some of the locals had, a, had trouble you know, saying it or, or really get, getting it down. It wasn't something we felt sticked and or stuck. So we helped them rebrand. This was a name that they actually came up with, something they had in their back pockets and they'd been thinking about rebranding for a long time. So Latin Cacao was the new brand name that we developed for them. We, we gave them some recommendations on presentation uh, based around, you know, which colors to use, which, uh, how do you tell your story, which voice do you use when you're presenting yourself as a company, right? And we developed a couple of, of very useful tools. One was the logos. We developed some logos for them. We also did some um, package labeling for, all the, for five of the main products that they're producing and then some brochures and business cards. And this is just another view of, of some of the, the graphic design we did. We had one gal on our team that was an awesome, awesome graphic designer and did uh, all of this part of the work for us. So that's the great thing about a smart team is you, you pick people from a different, different areas that are good at different things and you bring those skills together. One, another thing we wanted to understand is, are you profitable? If not, how do you get profitable? And if so, how do you maintain profitability, right? So we wanted to understand what were their actual production costs. We went in and timed their production methods. We really tried to derive all of the individual costs and put that together to find a cost per product. And then we, we looked at the prices they were currently charging, calculated margins off of that, and then did some sensitivity analysis around those, those current prices. Uh, and, it, and we needed to remember that Antonio and Tulia had no, never taken a college accounting course. They had no real formal education in that sense, right? So we wanted to make this understandable and usable by them. Now, they had a lot of business experience, right? So we took, we took their business experience, tried to understand where they were, in that level of understanding. And we developed in this handout that we gave to them that had all five parts of it, we developed some tables like this that showed not just the different products and the data that we collected, but okay, take this, add it to this, and this is what it tells you, and this is how you use it, that kind of information. Hope, hoping that it would be actual, actually usable for them. The next part was understanding consumer preferences. We took three different products out to people and we asked them to rate it on appearance, on flavor, and things like that. And we were able, to, and we asked them for willingness to pay as well. So we collected that information on chocolate de mesa, which is drinking chocolate made from solid bars, chocolate, chocolate instantaneo, which is like hot cocoa powder, like we would eat it here in the States. And then um, chocolate tea, cacao tea made from the shell of the bean. 
Um, very fun experience, very interesting experience to get people testing these things, and we collected some information that we felt was very useful for them. All this information, all these little snippets that you see on the side were put together in a very um, uh, very organized and, as you can see, well graphically designed uh, packet for these for Antonio and Tulia. The last thing we wanted to understand was the legal side of things. How do you register your product? Uh, how do you register with Envima, which is the food uh, food safety organization in Colombia? So we did that a little bit of that, but then we also um, went to we had the opportunity to lobby to on behalf of Antonio and Tulia and Asoprocos with the Minister of Agriculture for their state and also the mayor of their of their town, introducing Antonio and Tulia and what they were doing and asking for support. It was, uh, the efforts were a lot of, sorry, there's nothing we can do, but hopefully there's a foot in the door for any time something comes up in the future. So, what did we learn? Reviewing the two parts of the, of the project, we had the production side and the marketing side. And the production side, we, we feel like we were able to identify these most important production practices and figure out what socioeconomic and demographic factors were really affecting the adoption of those most important production practices. We sat down with the growers in Montes de Maria, the leaders of the growers associations, we presented this information to them, and we presented each data point and said, okay, this is, this is what the data is telling us. Let's have a discussion about this. Why could this be? What could be causing this with all these different grower, growers in, in the region? And that meeting was very, very helpful for, for, these, for these growers' asso uh, associations. After that, the, the marketing side of things, we found that yes, we do feel that they have a viable market and, and we're, we believe that with the vision and drive that Antonio Tulli have, they can be a leader in the region. They can bring other, other growers into this idea that yes, you can, you can extract more value, you can take yourself out of this relation, this typical relationship that you see in the cacao industry where the producer produces and get whatever gets whatever price the, the buyer decides to pay you, right? Um, like I said, it was it was an incredible experience. We learned a lot. We hope to continue this the, at least the smart side of this project with Asoprocos next year and hopefully several years past that. And now, any questions from anybody? Just before the questions, one thing that is very important is that. In my experience with these type of projects, I think they are successful as long as they are not only multidisciplinary, but also that they engage undergraduate students, graduate students, and faculty. Because each group brings uh, strengths, and and, and, they, they, I, and I think, as you see in, in the smart group, there were there was an undergraduate student, an MPS student, and a PhD student, and you are an MS student. Mm -hmm. So so that's very important, and I think that's something that we have here at Cornell that allows to do this type of classes. This is part of a class that leads to because one of the challenges in working on this is that you go collect data, leave, and then so what? The communities don't like that unless you pay them to collect data. But this is a project that this is a a way to work that that you you learn together with the communities and uh, that, and everybody learns. So thank you Miguel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Question in the back and then yes. Mark. Here we go. Yeah. Question in the back and then yes. Margaret. Hi. Um, very interesting presentation. I have a question. So basically, for this organization that you work for, if I understand correctly, there are 24 members and mm -hmm. they have 150 suppliers. Mm -hmm. So the first question is are these members also cocoa producers? Are they not? And if among these 150 plus suppliers that are not part of the organization, if there is any sort of desire for them to actually form part of the governance structure of this association and how they're thinking this is forward. And the second quick question is like, one of the main uh, reasons why producers also have to depend on a single buyer is because like, they need the, the cash advance to make like many of the procurement of the product. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in this case, uh, and I'm talking about like certain rural areas where for access to, to those are very difficult, right? right? So the only loans that they can get are literally from the from the supplier. So it's, it's an advance I mean from the from the buyer. So it's an advance basically for right. the, for the product. So if if there is a similar case also in Montes de Maria and then how might might there be a resolution to that? 
Okay, excellent. Very good questions. Your first question was about the structure of a sopocos. These 24 members, not all of them are producers. Actually, they've tried to bring in a couple of other people with other skills. Like they have um, a student, a, a college student that comes in and helps them with the administrative side of things because they're doing business. They have a couple of old professors that are retired and they're, they're members of the association. So they try to incorporate other people. The suppliers, I say, we say 150. That's like the average number of buyers that they bought from, this association bought from last year. But in reality, they could access much, much, many, many more buyers than that. People are unfortunately not very loyal to their association. So they'll sell to whoever's paying them the highest price, which is the idea of Tasso they're, they're gonna They're hoping to be able to pay a higher price to these growers. That makes sense? Your second question uh, again was, remember? Uh, in the absence of bank, of bank loans. Have right, right, okay, perfect. So actually the, the, there has been no, to our knowledge, um, loan or cash advance in this form amongst these growers. The way that these growers receive their cacao plants and a lot of their inputs have been through um, government programs. USAID has come in and done a couple of different projects there. So to our knowledge, that is that has not happened in this area for cacao. Now I think it's, it's probably happened with some other crops. Um, so, so there's no real um, tie or like permanent link between Nacional de Chocolates, which is the, the main company there, and, the, and these growers. Right? Again, they said, they've said, yeah, we've really appreciated them always being there because we always have somebody to sell to, but we're also getting $200 under the market price, or 200 pesos per ton under the market price. So, so tenfold is quite a big difference between yeah. what they're getting, what other people get. Yeah. And so my question has to do with pollination because you're moving the crop from a place where it has pollinators and midges to a place where it's not been grown before, I'm wondering if there are pollinators there to pollinate the flowers to give you the, the pods. It's a very, very good question. So there's actually some techniques that they've been developing as of the last year for manual pollination of these of the flowers, right? And there are we the part of our survey was we wanted to understand who was using that and how are they how are they using it. I think 6% of the growers were doing manual pollination. So, I mean, we, we saw insignificant results in our study, but we do know that, 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 I mean, agronomically speaking, that has significant effects on yields. And that's one of the, one of the techniques in cacao that is most known to really, really increase your yields. So, so you're right. I think that pollination is one of the, one of the big issues. It just didn't show up in, in our data because of a lack of use. <laughs> so, yeah. So in the cropping systems, are they toward being monocultures, being more diversified? Agroforestry. Agroforestry for sure. So they, so you'll see, I mean, agroforestry almost in the sense that they went and planted a couple of cacao trees in their forest, right? <laughs> so it's very, very little planning. It was more of, hey, we've got some of these trees. Let's go find some place to put them, right? Whereas a lot on your large scale side of things, going back to your question earlier, the growers that are doing large scale are still doing what they would call agroforestry systems, but it's, okay, let's take coconut, palms, and cacao, and those are gonna be our two crops, right? Or let's take um, some tropical hardwoods and cacao, and those are gonna be our crops, right? So again, this region does have actually a lot of tropical hardwoods, just naturally growing. It's a very, very old trees, right? So did, did you have a question back here? No? Yeah. I believe you said before that there was only a, a very small variety of cacao, well, not many varieties of cacao being grown in this region. Is that correct? So there's actually, so primarily CCN51 is the clone that is grown there. That comes from Ecuador. It's a crop that, or a variety that's done very, very well in Ecuador. Not greatest on quality, but really produces a, a high yield. They've taken CCN51. Um, Colombia's also produced a, a couple of different varieties. The interesting thing is most of these growers have no idea which varieties they're growing. We asked them and uh, 20, some between 20 and 25% of the growers actually could name the varieties um, in their fields and actually some portion of those mis misnamed them, right? So it was just something that they had heard somebody else say. So, so variety is a, another very, very big issue here because anybody who kn knows crops know that when something needs to be cross-pollinated, there's, there's some that work a lot better than others for cross-pollination. Right. And so I was also going to ask, is there an issue or a, or a concern about um, kind of repeating some of the troubles that happen with the avocados? If you're really relying on very few varieties of cacao, is there a disease or a pest pressure that could possibly compromise 
the development of this industry as, as, it, as it starts to scale up? I think so. Yeah. I think so. And I think that's something that certainly ought to be addressed with this region. So. Yeah, that's questions? a global concern, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the ICA you know, the, is the kind of the USDA, the ARS mm -hmm. economic. They, are, they have a big project trying to identify the variation in, in varieties mm -hmm. in cacao. And the interesting thing is that, like I, like I mentioned before, this is where cacao is from, right? Like this area, I mean, there's some dis debate as to where it originally came from, but generally speaking, people agree that it's somewhere in that northern tip of South America, in the jungles, right? So there, between there and kind of Venezuela. So you'll see varieties that, you know, people have never seen before. They call them criollo varieties, and they're they're just varieties that they found there in the region, naturally growing. So, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, no, it's a, it's a little bit on the same uh, point, really. Uh, the question that was going through my mind was, okay, you've got these you know, avocados, also basically the center of diversity. And therefore, you also have your pathogens, you know, your, yeah, in, in in that area. That, so you have have concerns that you wouldn't have in Africa or in other places if you export a crop somewhere else. And so cacao, of course, I don't know more about this than I do, but, but in, in Peru, for example, the Peruvians and the Ecuadorians think that, that, that they too are in the center of diversity of cacao. And there's also this, this big industry starting off and not very much concern, I would almost say as usual, being put into, well, how do we really, we talk about sustainability, but how do we do that really from an agroecological perspective? You know, what, where is this diversity? Where is the effort really to diversify from, from the main varieties, which are only about two or three right. around the world, basically, and we're just waiting for another catastrophe to happen, really. Right. And we have, what's going to happen again to these farmers or <coughs> producers that we're trying to actually support uh, in getting some more income. Right? So yeah. that worries me a little bit. Because, and then mm -hmm. it comes to my next question. Well, we're all getting excited now about, about cacao. Peru is getting excited. Ecuador is getting excited. So mm -hmm. is this going to be another boom bust thing that suddenly the prices are going to drop? Have we been concerned, concerned, mm -hmm. concerned about that? Right. And, and yeah. where's the thinking yeah. in that area going? It's very, very important macro level questions. <laughs> I, I cannot answer those to probably to, to, to your satisfaction, but especially because you know, five, three years ago, I remember in the in the press, you know, big deficit in you know short short supply for the huge demand that we have for chocolate in the world and cacao in general. I mean, the gap wasn't that big. And mm -hmm. and, uh, and prices are not the best, so that means that uh, yes, it's uh, yeah. there's a lot of a lot of uncertainty about, yeah. about this. And it's a, it's a very interesting crop because you have so many smallholders producing it, and so few people actually buying it. And those people can yes, they can manipulate a market for sure, right? And I think they probably have several times. So so you get into this, you know, this age-old question of this, you know, small scale versus large scale. Do we try to keep them in it? Do we try to help them get out of it? It's, I mean, and that's, I think cacao is, really epitomizes that discussion quite well. Good thing adding to that, with climate change, a lot of coffee growers are switching to cacao. Yeah. 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 In Central America, anyway. Right. They yeah. are doing the intercropping yeah. in Nicaragua, lots of intercropping with cacao. Just yeah. one, one thing about our economy, because I think it's, it's very real. So we did experiments with consumers taking the cacao nacional from Ecuador, which is the, the criollo, and the CNN, the, the ton, you know, this uh, variety. And when you take the chocolate uh, at the processing level, you can more or less equalize the flavor and, the, you know, you, the technology in, pro, in chocolate making can hide the bad uh, attributes of the, of the commercial, these three varieties, and, would be more or less the, the same. But I think that's where these movements are from, from the bean to bar, um, direct trade, that's what, what gives you hope for small growers. The, the thing is that 
there are too many of the small growers for the market to capture, you know, for the market to really... And the other thing is, you saw the, the graph, that, that the, the diagram, how little of the value is, is kept at the farm level. No, more than 80, 70% of the value that happens the retailer, wholesaler, processor. So it's how can we make that more transparent to the consumer so that they make, when they make choices, they know they are supporting a particular way to produce the, the chocolate that they are consuming. So. And, and I think one model that's really being used quite a bit in cacao at this point is the reshoring model, right? Bring as much of that, that processing back to origin as we can, yes. which is, which is I, I think, great, right? That's, that's one very fairly easy way to put a lot more of that value back into the, the origin country. Questions? Oh, I forgot, we should be probably passing this around so people can hear us. <laughs> um, so I have two questions. The first one, you said that uh, the farmers are harvesting less uh, than ideal, right? Less mm -hmm. amount of time. Is that due to certain labor shortages, like not enough people that are going into this, or is it more just lack of knowledge? Mm -hmm. And uh, or yeah. And second question, uh, based on uh, after the question on the associations, since these seem to be more marketing associations, how did you notice any want need for producers to come together and have some sort of more bargaining power as a more cooperative? Okay, also very good questions, thank you. So your first question was about um, labor shortages. So most of these farms were, in, were run by one farmer and worked by one farmer, and they had a bunch of other crops that they were doing, uh, growing as well. Our experience in the field suggests that it's not, a, not a necessarily a labor shortage. One, and, and our actual our statistical evidence suggests that Maybe even more than that, there's this perception of value that really drives their willingness to harvest, right? Because, because as we saw, the, num the larger number of, or the more people that they were selling to, the more they harvested, right? Which suggests, hey, you know, I've got, you know, three or four people that will buy this from me. I'm going to go pick some stuff off my trees. Something that we saw a lot of is crop just sitting on the trees and going to waste on the trees. So it's like literally low-hanging fruit. <laughs> there's, there's stuff that they could go out and grab. They just don't. Second question again. Producer level associate, uh, like grouping. Collective bargaining. Right, right. right. So, one thing we tried to do while we were there is we saw all these different leaders of these associations, and they all told me the same things, right? They're all like, yeah, we're facing these issues, and we, you know, really want to do this. And I was like, wait, that's the same thing that this other association told me. So, we got them together in a meeting, and, and just putting them in the same room was enough for them to say, hey, we're facing the same issues. Let's do something about it, right? Let's let's work on training programs between us. Let's work on collective bargaining. Let's let's get one voice for all 1,200 growers, and then go to Nacional de Chocolates and say, okay, we will do X, and you increase the price by this much. You know, so that that's in its very nascent stages. We've hit several roadblocks along the way of developing kind of like a larger association of associations, but they but there's the desire. So good. Um, I think we've got just a couple more minutes. Yeah, this question kind of builds off of that one, which is that, was there any interest or do you see any potential for these marketing or producers' cooperatives or associations to maybe start owning their own processing equipment and begin to do their own processing of the product and self-branding and distributing, kind of cutting out the middleman and beyond yeah. the horizon? Yeah, I, I really do think so, and I think that's the, the vision that these people have. So there's kind of two proce parts of processing for cacao. You need to ferment and dry it. That's your really, like, right after you crack it out of the pod, you have to ferment and dry it, right? And th so that's your post-harvest processing. And then there's what people term transformation, right? So that's grinding the beans down into to licor de chocolate, the um, <coughs> chocolate bark or yes. chocolate liquor, right? Yes. Yeah, you take, you take it to the nib form and then you can grind it down and make it into chocolates and things like that, right? So there's two, those two stages of processing. Right now, all of, the process, all of the fermenting and drying is happening on the actual farms, which is killing the quality. When you have a, a pod in, I mean, when you have cacao in a pod, 
you can say that it's like more or less it's great quality, right? <laughs> like as long as there's no real like bad diseases or anything like that, it's great quality. And then your fermentation and drying process really determines how much of that quality you maintain. Does that make sense? So the reason they're selling all of it, selling selling all of it at the lowest quality is because yeah, maybe there's you know a handful of people that are fermenting and drying correctly, but then there's 85 or 90 percent of them that are that are kind of messing it up for the others. So the idea is to is to buy cacao and baba or wet cacao. And, and so the producers bring it to them wet and they ferment and dry it at a particular facility that they create, right? And that maintain that really raises the quality for everybody, right? And there's, there's the other idea that from that facility, you can also start transforming cacao, which is what Antonio and Tulia have done in Asofocos. One comment about that, that is a little bit, uh, in general for food. So polyphenols and polyphenols are the ones that policies have to change as well. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example. Uh, the average tariff for exporting cocoa beans is about 8%. 5% in many places there is no tariff. But if you want to export chocolate bar, it's about 50 to 60%. So, you know, you see, of course, the countries that are importing want to generate value in their own borders, to generate employment, etc. But there is this issue of need also this is connected with policies that are that are national policies to to really incentivize that transfer of creating more value next to the origin, which I think is a very important issue because you think about this, most of the most interesting employment that this generates is not in the farms, it's in post-harvest and, and fermenting processes. I think we've run out of time, yeah. but I'd be happy to stick around and answer any other questions that people have. Is, is there going to be another version of the smart group that goes?